In the autumn of 1914, only months after World War I had begun, Lloyd George wanted to create a Welsh army so the Welsh could serve in the war. And this became the Welsh Division, the 38th Welsh Division as it was known. And that division consisted of about 18 and a half thousand men and it needed three complete field ambulances to support it. The 130th St John Field Ambulance became unique in World War I because it was the only unit in the whole of World War I which was recruited by St John in Wales. The Welsh Army Corps asked St John No. 11 district, which was effectively the whole of South Wales, except for the Eastern Valley of Monmouthshire, which was ostensibly England at that time, to raise one complete field ambulance. And that would involve three sections of 60 men each, who were nursing staff and stretcher bearers, uh, pharmacists, uh, non-commissioned officers included in those numbers, uh, the officers, Royal Army Medical Corps um, men, doctors from across Wales, Ireland, Scotland, England, and 30 Army Service Corps men, who were the only ones who were armed in the unit, who were the drivers of the horse ambulances and the motor ambulances. Now because this unit was specifically raised by St John, it was allowed to use the word St John in its name, and it was the only unit in the whole of World War I that was allowed to do that. And it was also the only unit in the whole of World War I that was allowed to wear the St John insignia, the eight-pointed cross badge on the left cuff of their uniform. So. The 130th St John Field Ambulance was an utterly unique entity in World War I, and they did some incredible work, unarmed as they were. The 130th trained mostly in Wales for the first part of their existence. Uh, they started in Porth Call, they went up to Crichieth and ended up in Prostatin. In August 1915, they came down to Winchester, where thousands and thousands of troops were massing, uh, ready to go across to the war. Now they went across on the 3rd of December 1915 and again they had to train in, well, war conditions. They'd been training away from the blood and the gore, if you like, but it was still training. But once they went over, they had to work with seasoned soldiers in the battle situations uh, to learn their trade even further. But the first large battle that they were involved in was the Battle of Mammoth Wood in the summer of 1916 on the Somme. Now, although there were three field ambulances looking after the Welsh Division attack on Mamet's Wood, the 130th were charged with the majority, almost all, the stretcher bearing, and the conditions were extreme. Some of the trenches they were supposed to carry the wounded through were knee-deep in mud. There were soldiers going up the trench to the war. There were regimental aid posts. Everything was getting in the way. They were being shelled or being machine-gunned. And it was an extraordinarily difficult job to do. And these men, sometimes it took them 12 hours to go 400 yards. The second large battle in which they were involved was in 1917, uh, which started on the 31st of July and lasted four days into August. And this was the battle for Pilkham Ridge, which was a part of Passchendaele, the third battle of Ypres. Again, the conditions were atrocious. Uh, the mud, well, it was almost impossible to, to describe. The ground had been heavily shelled, there had been heavy rain, there were huge craters in the ground full of mud, uh, and the difficulty was that all the designated routes through which they were supposed to carry the wounded back on stretchers had been obliterated by the shelling and the mud. So they had to specifically find a way through. Sergeant Ernest Sweeting, a sergeant from Newport, was the man who worked out how to get the wounded back across. Uh, and many of, many of the stretcher bearers worked so hard under extreme conditions, being shelled uh, without flinching to carry the wounded home. There were five military medals awarded uh, to those men in that battle. In fact, there were 26 military medals in all ward awarded to the 130th for gallantry, which is approximately four times the average per man or per hundred men, if you like, during the war. There were 26 military medals, uh, three of the men won Distinguished Conduct Medals, three of the officers won the Military Cross, uh, one of the men won the Croix de Guerre, uh, and the, uh, the, the commanding officer, which was pretty standard, got the Distinguished Service Order. The commanding officer was Lieutenant Colonel John E. H. Davis from Wrexham, uh, an eminent surgeon. He stayed with his men throughout the war by choice. Even though he was offered promotion, he decided to stay. And he was the only Welsh commander of a Welsh unit to stay in command of his men throughout the war. He became Surgeon General or Surgeon-in-Chief of St John 
after the war, as did uh, one of his other officers, Captain uh, Andrew Woodruff Anderson. The St John men, I think, were a very special breed. Um, they were different to many of the other soldiers in that they were almost all the original members of, of, of the group. They were, they were from the, the mines rescue teams around South Wales. William Coleman is a prime example. Uh, he was from Crumlin. Now, before the war, he was in one of the rescue squads in the mines with four brothers from the same family. There were five of them. Uh, during the war, uh, he distinguished himself by carrying an officer to safety on his shoulders. He was awarded the military medal. Uh, at one point, he was, he was gassed and partially blinded, but recovered. And when he came home from the war, he went back into St. John, served again with his brothers. And even in retirement, he came out in 1960 to work the Six Bells disaster. So they, was, they were very special. In battle conditions, they got so used to being shelled in the open, unarmed, unable to do anything about it, that they didn't die for cover because they wanted to get the wounded back. This is all they, all, all they wanted to do was to save lives. That, that is the St. John ethic through and through. It was inevitable during the war that the men of the 130th engaged in other activities to take their minds off the horrors of war. And almost every unit in the war would have its own concert parties and its sports parties. And the 130th was no stranger to that. Um, they had a, a male voice choir. Unfortunately, in training, um, in the competition that they were possibly going to win at one stage, when they got onto the stage, the stage collapsed and that collapsed and that sort of took the shine off the evening. But they had various concert parties, the dominoes and the busy bees and various others, and these provided the entertainment for the men in their unit and they gave concerts to men in other units too. And sports, there were no slackers either. They had a tug of war team, they had a cross country team, football, rugby of course, um, and they played many competitions against the other field ambulances, against the other Welsh division regiments, and, and against whoever was there to play against. Um, we had a couple of uh, celebrities amongst, amongst them in that uh, Bill Batchelor and uh, Trevor Nicholas uh, both played rugby for the 130th, but they also played rugby for the 38th Welsh Division team, which to have two out of a team with 18,500 men to choose from is quite extraordinary. And Trevor Nicholas, who was from Sudbrook, uh, he'd never played rugby in his life before he joined the 130th. He played for the 130th, he played for the Welsh Division, and when he came home, he played for Cardiff and was capped in the only Wales game, the International against the New Zealand Army in 1919. Um, they, they, they did everything they could. They were well known as, as good, a good tug of war team. They were the one to beat, basically. So their lives were very, very different. They, they enjoyed the sport because it was the relief they had. They enjoyed the entertainment because it was the relief they had. But uh, everything else that they had to do was pretty grim. By the end of the war, the makeup of the 130th had changed over the years. Men had become sick or ill or had been wounded and gone home, been transferred to other duties perhaps. Um, the 130th was extremely lucky in only losing a small number of men uh, over, over the period that they were in the war. Uh, they were a good band of brothers together and before the end of the war or at the end of the war before they came home, they decided that they would have a reunion. So in November 1919, uh, they had a, a reunion in Cardiff, a big dinner with all the officers and all the men. Um, and that Christmas, the commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, sent all the men a Christmas card, uh, which charted where they'd been each Christmas throughout the war from 1914 onwards, um, and to a, a really rather nice gesture to all the men. One of the most important legacies of the 130th St. John Field Ambulance is that its very existence, the fact that this unit was created from St. John men and served so extraordinarily in World War I, this contributed and played a huge part in Wales being awarded its own priory in 1918. So these men were incredibly important to St. John Cymru as it is today.